So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's CIHT webinar on the individual routes. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Greg Saunders, and I'm the Education and Qualifications Officer here at CIHT. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Richard Llewellyn, who's the Chair of CIHT's Education and Professional Development Strategy Board, and David Mellor, who's the Chair of CIHT's Individual Route Assessment Panel. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Kat Skumal, who's CIHT's Head of Education and Professional Development. And Kat will be helping me collate and respond to questions during today's webinar. Once the presentation has finished, we will be holding a live Q&A session. So please do enter any questions you may have in the questions tab of your GoToWebinar toolbar. Now, both Kat and I will type an answer to some of these questions during the webinar and we'll leave some others to be responded to by Richard and David at the end. What we would say is please do try and keep your questions as broad and as general as possible, as it may not be possible to answer very specific questions on certain individual projects that you've worked on. So for those of you who may not be aware, just going to give you a quick introduction about who we are. Um, CIHT is a charity, learning society and professional membership body. And we're the leading voice of the highways and transportation infrastructure profession, both in the UK and globally. Our members work in the private, public and academic sectors. And essentially, we like to think of ourselves as being the natural home for everyone and everybody working in highways and transportation infrastructure. We have 12 CIHT regions and nations and several international groups in countries such as Hong Kong, Qatar, Malaysia and the Republic of Ireland. And very relevant to today's webinar, we're licensed by the Engineering Council to assess our members against the relevant standards for CNG, ING and ENGTEC registration. Now, in order to apply for any of these levels of professional registration, you will need to join CIHT as a member. And we have a range of grades to support you throughout your career in highways and transportation. But no matter where you are in your career, there is a suitable grade of membership for you. So if you're very early on in your career, you can join us either as a graduate member or an associate member. And then once you've acquired three years of relevant professional experience, you can then apply to become a full member. And if you've already been working in highways and transportation for some time, and you're now operating at a relatively senior level in the profession, you may also be eligible to be elected as a fellow. So if you are interested in joining us, um, it's a very straightforward online process. We simply need some of your personal and professional details, um, a copy of your CV, and details of two sponsors as well. And these can either be CIHT members or members of another professional body. There's no interview required, and it usually takes around three to four weeks to receive confirmation of your election as a member. And finally, to become a member, you don't need a degree and you don't have to be ready to apply for professional registration yet. But once you are successfully elected, um, you'll receive a membership certificate from us and you'll be able to use the relevant post nominals and access support from CIHT to work towards becoming professionally registered. And there's a link on your screen there um, if you are interested in starting your membership application. So that's everything from me. I'll hand over now to Richard and David who will discuss today's topic, the individual routes. And I'll just make Richard the presenter. OK, that's great. And I will now just um, show my screen. So let's just make sure we can see the right one. OK, and uh, yeah, right, we're ready to go, I believe. Um, hopefully you should be able to see the slides uh, just now and uh, be able to hear me uh, live and clear. Um, so my name is uh, Richard Llewellyn. Um, I am the chair of uh, CHT's Education and Professional Development Strategy Board. I've been in that role now for uh, two years and um, we look after uh, the professional qualifications amongst other uh, tasks uh, that the board undertakes. Um, my day job, um, I'm currently a lecturer uh, Edinburgh Napier University. I teach on the uh, civil engineering and civil and transportation engineering degrees and the MSc in transport planning and engineering. I've been in higher education now for, for 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I spent the first 15 years of my career in uh, consultancy, engineering consultancy. Uh, I am a chartered uh, engineer. 
Um, I'm very passionate about uh, getting others through that route too. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And I think from the board's perspective, uh, this is a, a presentation that's been, been long overdue. Uh, we have um, a lot of candidates um, without those um, uh, initial educational um, qualifications that, that the other candidates have. Um, so, so really supporting uh, those in that role is um, one of our key targets of the board. So I'll just hand over to David very quickly, who can give an introduction on himself, and then we can get started with the presentation. Hi, I'm Dave Meller. I'm uh, chair of uh, CIHD's individual group assessment panel. I've been working in uh, highways and transportation for many years, um, since the 1980s. Uh, I started doing professional reviews with CIHT about 15 years ago, and I've been doing the technical report assessments now for about eight or nine years, um, and been chair of the panel for the, for the last two years. Over to Richard. Great, thanks very much, David. Uh, great. Um, so, what we're going to do um, for the uh, the presentation, if I can move the slide on, there we go. Um, first of all, just starting off with, um, well, hopefully uh, you've got a good idea as to to why you're here today. Uh, but the first part of the presentation will really be just covering off really what the individual route is all about, who's it for, why do we do it, um, what are the requirements for it, and um, yeah, we'll, we'll be looking at some of the detail as to um, who's responsible for those requirements and, and the kind of things we're looking for um, as part of going through this route. Um, there are three different ways of, of, of undertaking this route, which we'll cover off in that initial part, but we're going to cover mainly the technical report route, which is the most common uh, individual route that applicants take, uh, and that comprises three stages, uh, the synopsis, the technical report itself, and the interview stage as well. Um, so what we're going to do as part of those is, is, is go through what each of those stages mean and talk about what we're looking for um, as reviewers during those stages. Uh, and throughout all three stages we'll be talking about some of the the common issues that uh, that we find with with candidates and how uh, in terms of your own applications uh, you can hopefully go about uh, um, avoiding those and uh, bringing about uh, the, the best representation of you as a as a particular candidate and then of course at the end we'll be open for uh, questions and answers and hopefully any uh, remaining questions uh, we can cover off uh, during that period as well so um, if we can move on uh, first of all to the individual route and who it's for. A um, little bit of background first of all uh, to talk about uh, the professional qualifications, where they come from. Um, hopefully you will be aware of this, but the awarding body, the ultimate regulatory body for um, professional qualifications in the UK uh, is the Engineering Council, Engineering Council or NC as it's commonly referred to um, in shorthand. Now that organisation operates under uh, a Royal Charter, which is granted by uh, the UK monarch for awarding uh, these professional uh, qualifications. That awarding process is done through um, a number of licensed institutions and the Engineering Council defines the rules under which those licensed institutions uh, must uh, uh, respond to. So those professional qualifications, as we know, EngTech, iEng, and CEng, and the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation is one of 39 uh, licensees uh, able to register applicants under these qualifications. Um, it's, a, it's probably worth saying at this point. It's a common misconception that you know the different institutions have easier or easier options. That's really false. We are all working to the same rule book, and that rule book is the UK spec, the UK standard for professional engineering competence and commitment. And we're going to be referring uh, to UK spec quite a bit in what we're what we're saying today. So UK spec um, defines uh, the competence and commitment that any applicant must demonstrate to be professional re professionally registered, and that's regardless of which institution uh, that you go for. Uh, through. Um, the levels of competence and commitment increases. So starting with EngTech, we see a greater level of competence and commitment expected at iEng level, and then ultimately at Chartered Engineer level. Underneath those uh, competence and commitment requirements, there's five key areas that we're, we require applicants to demonstrate. Um, so A, knowledge and understanding, B, design, development and some solving engineering problems, 
C, responsibility, management and leadership. D, communication and interpersonal skills. And E, professional commitment. And those levels increase as you move through the different uh, qualifications. Now, that first one in particular, that knowledge, understanding and skills um, form an essential part of any engineer's competence and is a prerequisite for professional registration under the qualifications that I mentioned previously. Uh, this is very much the, the theoretical side of, uh, of engineering competence. Um, it provides that underpinning logic and ca capabilities to analyze problems and um, it's all about having a full understanding of what the engineering problem that you're talking about uh, comprises, rather than simply applying standards reply, uh, or, or relying on instructions. So really that's what it's all about. It's understanding that engineering theory. Now, as we'll know, one way of understanding engineering theory is by undertaking um, an educational program through a higher educational uh, institution. So if you have a, a degree, for example, at bachelor's level, that is the educational requirement uh, for the ING um, uh, level of qualification, at master's level for the CENG uh, level of qualification, provided those degrees are what we call accredited. So an accredited degree, again, is something that is defined by the Engineering Council and every single uh, educational institution in the UK that, that offers these degrees um, has been accredited through the Engineering Council. If you want to check whether your own degree is accredited, you can do that either using the Engineering Council's website or by approaching the membership department here at the CIHT as well. So that is an accredited degree. So. A degree is one way of demonstrating uh, and, and understanding engineering pr uh, principles, but it's not the only way. Uh, you may have done a degree from a different discipline, you may have done a degree uh, that is not accredited, or you may not have done a degree at all. That doesn't mean that you can't um, start to understand uh, those theoretical principles and become aware of those professional uh, uh, requirements. So there are other ways of doing this. You might have done other formal academic training, you might have done training within employment, you might have done some experiential learning where you've been learning things on the job and learning about the theory of, of, uh, of engineering principles on the job, or you may have done your own self-directed learning through reading or research. Now, the uh, Engineering Council at UK Spec recognises this and it permits licensees such as CIHT to perform individual assessments to verify that you have that underpinning learning and understanding. And in effect, what we're doing there is we're, we're undertaking a very similar role to a university would if they were um, awarding a degree to you. We're checking that you have that equivalent knowledge um, from a degree program through other means of learning. So really that's what the in, uh, individual route um, is all about. Um, so as I mentioned in the introductory part there, there are currently two, and that will be expanded shortly subject to a successful pilot to three individual routes. Um, the first individual route is uh, not used uh, that often. It's something called the further learning report. This is mainly something that we find applicable where we've got uh, particularly overseas candidates where uh, the accreditation of degrees might not be as common, but you may have done an engineering degree that's very similar to an accredited uh, degree in the in the UK, but hasn't actually been accredited. We would look for a further learning report as the, in that particular route. Uh, the most common form of approach for uh, UK candidates is the technical re uh, report. This is where we have individu individuals uh, wanting to apply for professional registration without higher educational qualification. So in, the, in that way, we do the assessment through the individual route of the technical report. There's also been recently a recognition that there are um, uh, a reasonably large number of candidates that have worked in industry for, for several years, have a lot of experience, and with a lot of experience, we're, we're probably talking um, in, in the kind of the decades range of experience with significant experience, and now are in senior management positions and perhaps are not doing the everyday application um, of engineering as they have done previously. However, they have that experience from, from, uh, from past things that they've done. So this year we've been, we've been piloting an experiential route, and there may be people on this 
next call that are interested uh, in that as a future route. So please do watch this space. We'll be running another pilot later on this year um, to finalize the arrangements for that. And we do hope to offer that route um, formally to all potentially in the next year or so. So keep your eye open for that particular one. You'll find all details uh, for all three routes um, on the CHD website under the professional registration applicant guidance notes uh, that you can see on screen just there. Finally, I'd just like to highlight something, and um, we're about to talk about the details of the actual individual route, but probably one of the most common misconceptions we get with the individual route is that it's it's in effect the professional review, and we're, we're looking for similar things uh, that we would see in a professional review. That really is, is, a, is a bit of a, a, a misconception. What we're really looking at is that theoretical underpinning knowledge um, and, and really what we're looking to see is that you've met the learning outcomes that are pre uh, prescribed by the AHEP standard. That's the standard that, that's applied to degree qualifications. And that's the kind of thing that we're looking for. Now, yes, there may well be some overlap uh, between what you would present a professional review later on. You might talk about the same projects, the same areas of experience, but just to emphasize the focus that we're looking at here is very different. We're looking for that theoretical underpinning knowledge, your understanding of what's going on and those engineering principles. So in effect, it's more the kind of the why, what, what, why is that happening rather than the how, what, what, when, and where. So please do bear that in mind um, as you're uh, preparing your application if this is the route uh, that you're choosing to do. So um, we'll now talk about the technical uh, report route uh, in more detail. And as I mentioned previously, that comprises uh, three stages, the synopsis stage, uh, the technical report stage, and the interview stage. So I'll hand over to David just now, um, who will talk about those three stages in turn. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, so if we move on to the next, uh, move on to the next slide. Um, so there, the, the synopsis is an outline of, of what you propose to discuss. It's, it, the purpose of it is really so that the assessors can see that the subjects that, that you're going to cover are going to be covered in, to adequate depth to, to demonstrate that you have achieved the learning outcomes in, in AHEP. Um, so the, the first thing you need to do there is, is to submit, uh, complete the synopsis form, um, no more than 1500 words of how you propose to address those learning outcomes. Um, we do encourage you to, to find a mentor. If you have difficulty finding a mentor yourself, uh, I think that CIHT's education team can sometimes um, put you in touch with uh, with a mentor, and um, and also once you've some, you've completed your synopsis, um, that will need to be signed off by uh, a sponsor as well, who who needs to be somebody who knows you uh, and can verify that this is your work, um, and then that will be looked at as I say to to see whether the, it's going to take you at your head, whether you're heading in the right direction to um, be able to submit a sub successful technical report. So the, the, the main thing to consider at synopsis stage is what you're going to cover in your full technical report. Um, and as AHEP, breaks those learning outcomes down into five areas and they're on the screen there but the the one that tends to cause the greatest difficulty for applicants is the science and mathematics or science scientific and mathematical principles engineering principles so um there's a there is an organization called the joint board of moderators which ciht is a member of that along with some other sort uh, engineering institutions involved in the infrastructure engineering side of things um and the the jbm has produced a document 
uh, that, that is really aimed at, at academic institutions to give them some guidance on what um, degree programmes need to include in order to be accredited. And uh, they set out their three core subjects of structures, materials and geotechnics and then two from the, the longer list there of uh, various en engineering and, and, and associated subjects. Um, I would say from my experience of assessing submissions over the years, the ones that um, you know tend to be successful have something from those subjects that I've listed there of structures, fairly infrequently to be honest structures but materials pavement design being um, a, a popular one um, some geotechnics some some drainage is another one that's um, very popular and geometrical design the principles of geometric design of highways or whatever I mean this could equally apply to the rail sector and um, possibly to, to the aviation sector in certain areas as well. Um, I've said their most successful submissions include an, an element of numerical analysis. You do need to, to show some numerical analysis somewhere in, in your submission. Um, but whilst those are the key subjects there have been others that have, have been on uh, various other things if you can get a, a, the advice of a mentor that's going to be very helpful here um so the, the first big hint i would give you i i've mentored a few candidates through the the, the, the technical report stage and and some of them ha having prepared a nice synopsis um, and submitted that and got the go ahead, I've then sat down to, to write the full report and thought, oh, I need to de deviate a bit from, from the synopsis. Or I've covered, I've mentioned that in the synopsis, and I, but I can't really cover it in the report. You do need to make sure that if you've submitted a synopsis on something, that the full report is going to follow that synopsis. So it would be useful for you i think to do a bit bit more of an outline of what you're going to put in the full report um a, a list of chapter headings or or you know fill out in your own mind or, um, or on a sketch or whatever um some more detail of what you're going to to put in the full report a bit more than is in the the synopsis perhaps or just headings as i say um and then the next point is that it, when you get the feedback from the synopsis there will usually be some advice from the assessors who have looked at that if you get any advice like that please make sure you follow it because it's that advice is there for your benefit um and and if you don't follow that you're you're really on the first um, step towards failure ultimately um so do make sure you follow any advice that you get right so then moving on the full technical report um yeah following the synopsis you have you've got 12 months to submit the full report and and there, again there's a form to do that the full technical report is 8000 words in the technical report um but there can be uh, well there, there are expected to be appendices uh, in addition to that um and the technical report is structured against those 
the AHEP learning outcomes that um, were on a on a previous slide. And yeah, again, just to reinforce what we're looking for there is demonstration of the knowledge and understanding that you've achieved. Um, and yeah, you're, you're unlikely to be able to cover everything um, with one's individual project. So you'll need to pull in um, various sources. But I, I would say don't make it too broad because otherwise you'll have difficulty in keeping to the 8,000 words. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, like I say, 8,000 words um, may sound a lot to start with, but there is quite a bit to cover. Um, so you, you may need to trim things down, edit things down a bit. Um, then remember that the assessment is of you. It's not a project report. It's not about the projects you, you've worked on per se, it's it's about what you have learnt from working on those projects. Um, so, as I say, 8,000 words sounds a lot, but can quickly run out. So don't use too much, much space out of your 8,000 8, words in describing those projects. Give an outline of what's necessary so that the assessors can understand the situation and then get straight in with um, the detail of what you've learnt. Use your appendices to to fill out that, um, the old saying of a, the picture painting a thousand words, so putting in a, a drawing in the appendix um, or a, a spreadsheet or something like that will will often save you some of those 8,000 words. Um, do include drawings, calculations, and so on, but only where they're relevant and only to the extent that you need to have them to demonstrate achievement of the learning outcomes. Um, I did one several years ago where I had every drainage drawing on a development, not, uh, not necessary, for getting that understanding. Um, do make sure you use spelling grammar checking software. It's frustrating as an assessor to see things that where, particularly if sentences don't don't properly make sense, um, it, it, you can start to lose some meaning there if you're not careful. So do use the, the tools that are available to you. Um, it's useful to include references to source documents in a bibliography so that we can see where you're coming from uh, and make sure that the abbreviations and, and specialist terms are fully explained there. And quite a few candidates do include a glossary. I think that may be mentioned in the guidance as well. Um, right. So, um, the report needs to go further than just, you know, we, we're not just looking for um, demonstration that you've complied with design standards. We need, we need at this stage to, um, to know, particularly for chartered engineer level, we need to see that you understand why the standards say what they say. Um, so I've said there's something like if, if you're in the, the highways engineering side of things, um, demonstrating how you've made a case for a departure from standard or um, made the case for aspects not covered by standards, or if you're in the construction side, perhaps closing out the non-conformance or, or accepting a defect on a job. All those things where 
you have to explain or understand why the standards say what they say, what the consequences are of not complying with the standards, mitigating circumstances in this particular case, risk assessments that you might have carried out, all those sorts of things can come into play there. And they are really good for demonstrating your understanding of, of the principles. Um, so I've said there, the, the report, what you're, the work that you're covering in the report doesn't necessarily have to be 100% your own work, um, but you do need to understand the principles that are in there and you, you do need, if asked questions at the interview, you will need to be able to answer not just on that particular aspect that you've put into the report, but you might be asked, well, why did you do that and not do something else and, and things like that? So you, you do need to, to understand the situation 100%, but it could be something that a colleague or somebody or maybe a subconsultant or whatever has done. And like I said, I've said there again, it's most unlikely to be related to a single project, but try not to make it too many projects because otherwise you'll you'll spend more time explaining the situation of each uh, individual circumstance than than get into the, down the nitty gritty. And then just some of the 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 usual um, messages about preparing a report once you've written it put it on one side for a couple of weeks, go back and read it, edit it. Perhaps you might, you know, think of additional things that need to go into appendices or, or whatever. Um, and do get your mentor, get somebody else to read it. Even if you can't get a formal mentor, it, it's useful to have just a, another colleague or your line manager or whatever read it and make some comments on it. They can't write it for you, but um, they can give you some guidance on that side of things. Um, and then through to the interview. So the when, when you submit the report, the assessors will have a look through it just to verify again that there is enough technical content in there to make it worth your while and theirs in having um, an interview. Um, I, I'd like to think that we are getting somewhere with the with the guidance that, that's out there now because it has been a while since I've had a, a report come through that where we've thought no the, the candidate really needs to have a, a, another bash at this. Um, interview normally lasts an hour. Um, default form of interview is online. You can ask for a, a, an in-person interview. Um, and then there's there's a few admin things for um, Greg to deal with um, prior to the, the interview. The the interview is is taken by two assessors. Um, the assessors are drawn, as are the presenters for this, from um, so one academic and one practitioner, if we can. It's not always possible. We do. We would like to ensure that um, you have the same assessors through the synopsis and the report. But again, that's not always possible because of the way that some people are quicker with coming up with the full report than others. So you can find that some assessors um, have, have a large workload at, at a given level. We will, however, unless there's a real problem, it will be the same two assessors who look at your report initially to decide whether you're okay to go to interview and then follow on with the interview but between synopsis and report it can be different 
um, there might be a trainee assessor, there might be an auditor there. They're not, not anything to do with um, the interview. They are, well, in, in case of an auditor, they're there to check on us as the assessors rather than you as the candidate. And a trainee is, is just there to, to, um, to train, fairly obviously. Um, yeah, the, we might, we usually ask the, the applicant to say something about their career for five minutes. Um, so it's an idea to, for you as the candidate to have a few thoughts on what you might say there. Don't uh, take more than five minutes because there'll be enough um, to fill the rest of the hour anyway. Um, and yeah, we'll try and structure the, the discussion. It does tend to be more more of a sort of um, a discussion than um, a question and answer session, strictly speaking. But um, I'll go into that a bit more. <clears throat> and then um, when the interview's over, you should get uh, hit, get to hear the result within about six weeks. And uh, right. So some more hints for the the interview. Um, try to to get your mentor or again some managers in your organisation to have a look at the um, the report and sit you sit down with you and arrange a mock interview. Um, and then again, I've, I've said. Um, you know, just have a, a few ideas about what you're going to say about your career what, to date. Um, usual things again about interviews that, that apply equally at, at this at a technical report interview and at professional review is if you don't understand the question, ask for, for clarification, make sure you do understand it. Don't try and just waffle your way through because um, that won't get you or the the assessors anywhere and try to keep your responses relatively succinct um, don't ramble on with too many ifs and what you know maybes and so on the the assessors might ask you a question that says well if, if that hadn't happened what would you have done um, so yeah in that case you do but um, then finally, just remember they're not trying to trip you up, um, and that there's a lot more paperwork if you um, if you fail than if you pass. And I think on that point, I head hand back to Richard. Great, excellent, thanks, David. And I think that is a, a fair point uh, in that um, we do want uh, you know to get the best from you, and um, when we are interviewing. That's certainly what we try to do. If we, we will try to get that answer out of you as best as we can. If you don't know it, you, you won't know it. But if we can find a way of, of getting that from you, um, we will try to our best to get that. We're not there to trip you up. Um, I think just to, to finish things off, uh, really, is just to go back to what I was saying um, to start with. Um, and throughout that process, which David now has, has eloquently uh, described to you, the, uh, the synopsis, the technical report and the interview, what we're trying to do is assess uh, your understanding of that engineering theory uh, that you're applying perhaps in your everyday job. Um, and it's worth just going back to what where you might find out what that is uh, and what you're supposed to know and what, what we're assessing you against. So I would recommend uh, you to have a look, um, um, very importantly, I think at the, the AHEP requirements because the AHEP requirements really do um, summarize those areas that we're, we're looking at. So there are tables within there that tell you the type of things that we're, uh, we're looking for. Um, obviously referring back to the uh, UK spec is also useful um, at this stage because ultimately that tells you what you're aiming for in your professional qualification. 
And in terms of the process and the routes, um, then the CIHT guidance there available on the CIHT website um, for the routes through to uh, to membership, um, a very useful document to have a look at. So, so do familiarise yourself um, with all of those. And the team here at CIHT and the membership department, very, very happy to, uh, to help with any clarifications. And if necessary, if you've got questions, uh, they will uh, refer back to um, us as assessors. And if there's any particular area that you need a bit of clarification on, please don't hesitate to ask, even in advance of, of going through the process. We're, we're here to help and uh, we want to help you get through this. Um, so really that kind of concludes uh, what we have to say uh, formally for the presentation. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the uh, screen just now. And um, if um, I think, Greg, hopefully you've uh, been, we've had some questions coming through, or if not, if we can invite um, anyone with questions uh, to type them into the uh, the question box. Um, and David and I will be very happy now to uh, to answer any that you may have. So any questions, Greg, from, from your side of things? Uh, it's Kat here for now, but Greg and I will <laughs> split it between us, that's okay, just so you're not surprised that it's me speaking. Um, the first question is about the 8,000 words for the technical report, and does that include appendices, bibliography and glossary? No. <laughs> a, a nice simple answer. I mean, to, to to expand on that, I mean, I think I think David made a very good point there uh, in the presentation about a picture saying a thousand words, and actually, um, the number of words that that you get, um, there's a lot of um, educational um, learning objectives that you're trying to address here, and eight thousand words, you know, it, it is quite a stretch to to get that within the eight thousand words if you're using words alone. So I would encourage you to, uh, you know, to use um, uh, drawings and and appendix can also have calculations and things uh, within them as well. A very very good way of getting across the demonstration of of, of that learning. We're we're not we're not assessing people on the number of words they've used. I mean, this says, as an academic, I always get this question, oh, uh, you know, how many words do I need to write to pass? It, you know, it doesn't work that way. It's it's the quality that counts rather than the uh, the, the quality, uh, the, the quantity, sorry. So, uh, so do bear that in mind. That's great, thanks both. Um, next question is about uh, someone who's gained experience internationally um, before getting the, um, the, the qualifications and want to know can they count that experience gained outside of the UK towards an application through the individual route? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the, this exercise is about engineering and scientific principles uh, and they're the same worldwide. Um, so yeah, it, you may have worked with, with different standards in in different parts of the world but the principles that are behind those standards will be the same wherever you are hi there yep, it's I'm... uh it's greg here uh sorry richard did you have anything to add to that no no when no. you go greg that's fine uh so we've had a question here that says um does i think this touches on one of david's slides where you spoke about some possible um areas of discussion um, but the person's asked does the synopsis and report need to cover a combination of those main subject areas or could it focus on one individual area such as pavement design or an, an analysis yeah i mean it, yes it can do um if yeah and we have had some some candidates uh, whose background is entirely in pavement so um the engineer the, the principles that first um main heading of the, of the learning outcomes could could be um about you know entirely based on on pavement design or something something like that but it's important to to emphasize that as as you progress through the the, the the headings of the learning outcomes they do become more um associated with with sort of the things like project management and um risk assessment and sustainability and so on so um yeah if if you've if all your work experience is in pavement engineering you, you still need to make sure that you're covering those aspects as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think um, it's always good, as David says, there to to go back to the uh, the AHEP document and to 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 look at what you're trying to show us. And I think we we do uh, clearly appreciate that that people have certain expertise uh, in certain areas. That's their day job: a payment engineer, geotechnics engineer, uh, that's that sort of thing. Um, as an engineer, though, you should you should have awareness of of, of other disciplines as well. Um, so it's important to be able to to demonstrate that you do have awareness of you know if you're a pavement designer, you know what implications might be in geotechnical terms. Not not, not that you're necessarily an expert in geotechnics at all, but you just have a, a an understanding um, of that. Um, and again, I would refer back to the the AHIP guidance, which will I'll, I'll cover the specifics uh, on that side of things. Yeah, I mean, again, there may be associated issues that come into the pavement design because at the end of the day, the pavement is laid on something that is geotechnics. Um, heck of a lot of the issues in pavement design come are associated with the drainage of it. So there you go. You've covered three of those other uh, three of those areas already. Um, there's sort of. A Perhaps to build on that, there's a question asking about people sort of working in a, a transport planning or traffic engineering specialism. How do they sort of demonstrate the technical elements um, in technical report? I, th I think this, this is this is probably a good one for me to answer <laughs> uh, because um, I, um, by, by tra although I'm a lecturer these days, um, my career was one as a transport planner uh, primarily i did a civil engineering degree but but my my day job was was really uh in in transport planning um i think with regard to um you know traffic engineering um uh, and, and the transport planning side of things um it's important to 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 get um, some experience and some understanding of of those principles um, in 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 action. So if you're if you're undertaking traffic engineering, for example, um, I don't know, maybe you're developing active travel schemes or, or, or bus priority schemes or something like that. Um, yes, you won't be uh, designing you know major uh, networks, but you may be moving curb lines, you know, changing white lines on the road. You might be um, specifying different surface types, dealing with 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 contracts for implementation on on those um so all of that is, is is relevant the scale might be slightly different to 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 uh to major projects but that that doesn't matter but what i would say is you do have to have that engineering experience as as, as part of that and that's that's very important we we do sometimes get candidates from um, a purely transport planning background um now there's you know, there's a choice to be made there, I think, between the types of professional qualification you want to go for. There is a, the Chartered Transport uh, Planning Professional uh, qualification, which is a different different qualification entirely, a different route to getting that qualification. But if you're purely looking at transport planning, that would be um, a more straightforward qualification to go for. That's not to say uh, that if, if that's an area you're involved in, you couldn't go for the uh, uh, the engineering related qualifications, but you will need to get that experience um, as part of um, your, your work and get that understanding. And um, I think when we, when we have candidates in that position, we recommend that you perhaps look for um, uh, you know uh, rotations or secondments within your employer. You know, work with a uh, a more sort of um, heavily associated engineering team, for example, to, to pick up that experience and to learn more about those uh, those standards and, and those theories behind those standards um, as well to be able to do that. So, um, yeah, it, 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 I think there's a, you know, um, uh, something to be um, taken from that. Um, I, I know that a lot of people get, because of promotional routes within organizations have traditionally, I think it's changing these days, but have traditionally pushed people towards chartered engineer and that, and that sort of thing, have, have been sort of drawn towards that as a qualification. But that is that is very much changing and it's something that's been, uh, been championed by um, uh, major employers and uh, government organizations as well. So, um, you know, both, both options uh, are there. Um, so, but you know, th there's no reason at all, and I speak um, from from someone from that background myself, uh, why you, you couldn't go down that route and get that experience. But I would caveat that by saying, make sure you you get that tailored experience um, to be able to do so. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add from, from your perspective, David, on on that side of things at all. No, just to emphasise what you said that um, traditionally people have looked for for the chartered engineer status. I think that is changing. 
um, now that, that, that there is, because the, the Chartered Transportation Planner qualification has only been around for a relatively short time now, but I think people are starting to get used to it uh, and you will see that becoming more common in, in, uh, in the industry. Thank you both. Um, so we've got another question here. Um, now that the technical report stage two form um, is structured around the AHEP headings, um, for instance, um, one box for each heading, um, as opposed to the old format, which was a kind of free flowing report, is it OK to have some repetition of evidence where it might cover more than one learning outcome? You, you can certainly you can use the same project across a whole host of, of things uh, um, I'd be careful with with repeating the same words um, because you're again you know 8,000 words isn't isn't a lot when you get into it um, what I would suggest you do is is if you want to refer to uh, the same situation in two boxes of, of the form um, it, then you you set that out in the in the first instance that you raise it and when you come to the next one you just say on the so-and-so project I you know this arose uh, and you, you deal with it like that Yeah, I mean, I think that there there is inevitably um, you will have uh, applied different skills and 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 understood different theory on on different projects. Um, I think the other thing to say about that is yeah, just be mindful of the words and and you know reintroducing the same project again. Well, as we were saying earlier on, um, you know, eight thousand words overall is a limited amount. So once it's been introduced once, there's no need to sort of fully introduce it again. But concentrate on that uh, that learning outcome that you're trying to develop, and there will be a slightly different uh, focus depending on which learning outcome you, you, you're demonstrating. So just, just try to be mindful of that. That's great. Thanks, um, both of you. Um, a few people have asked who about qualif existing qualifications that they have, whether that's an HNC or a, a BNG, and can they use sort of evidence from those qualifications in their technical report to demonstrate some of the learning outcomes? That's Richard. That's for you. In there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Um, uh, the, well, the answer to that is 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 yes. In 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 in. Um, but but also be mindful of what the AHEP requirements are. So if you've got a non-accredited degree, or um, a degree to uh, or a or a, a diploma or a certificate, uh, be aware where there might be a little bit of a gap between what you have learned and 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 the ultimate learning outcome that you're trying to demonstrate. But as I say, you know, learning can come from many different sources, uh, from uh, from application on the job, from from training courses, from other degrees, from reading, all sorts of places. But you just need to be able to demonstrate that you 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 have got that that knowledge. So um, it 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 would be something that we'd expect it to be referred to uh, within uh, within your report and within the synopsis if you were going to use that. Thanks. Um, I can see there's quite a few questions of people asking about the experiential route, so um, perhaps I can just sort of give a little bit more of an update on that, Thank but you. do both feel free to, <laughs> to add in. Um, the experiential route is very much being piloted at the moment, so it's just a, a very small number of pilot candidates. The aim is that it would be for people who are already IENG registered or have a partially accredited degree. So you've already sort of demonstrated some of the learning outcomes. We hope that it will be available to more candidates from, from next year, um, but, it, but it would be, it's likely to still be those requirements for the experiential route. So, and it's quite similar in terms of what would be expected to the technical report um, in that you will need to demonstrate the AHEP learning outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, watch watch this space on that one. Are we? Uh, I'm not sure if we're taking any more volunteers for the pilot, or or, or is that uh, closed at the moment? The pilot is is full. Uh, more, yeah. So we're not taking anyone else at the moment because because the next round is quite soon. It's in in August. So most people are quite a long way towards getting together their report who are part of the pilot. But we'll be evaluating that over the the autumn, uh, with a view to to roll it out further next year. 
I mean, I think it, it, it's worth saying that the uh, initial, the first round pilot that we held uh, in the spring of this year was was well received by uh, by candidates and indeed uh, the institution side of things. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it uh, if you are um, or you do feel that that route is applicable to you, it's one worth uh, hanging out for and, uh, and and waiting for because it does seem to work well for uh, for for candidates in that position. But it is a similar route to the technical report route. So, um, you know, it's something that um, if, if, if you want to move on things now, there's no reason why you shouldn't uh, just continue with the technical report as well. But uh, hopefully we should be seeing that one coming uh, in due course. Um, thank you. And um, just a couple more questions, perhaps. Um, somebody is asking, does a project need to be implemented on site before it can be included in a technical report? Not in, not necessarily. Um, what you are, what we are looking for to some extent is that you've you've learned from from experience. So it is good to see something there where you've um, you've verified that something has has worked or you know has been or you've modified something um as a result of experience but yeah it doesn't doesn't have to be something that's been um been implemented yeah i mean i, I think um well inevitably in the engineering profession we we have those working on the uh, on the design side and those working on the construction side so there's always going to be um a uh, a slight bias towards either design or the or the or the construction side depending on what uh, what in, uh, what um organization should i say uh, you're working in but again i go back to the point i made previously just about awareness when we were talking about the um uh, the connection between you know highway alignment geotechnics drainage and all of that sort of thing um it's good to have an awareness of you know if you are designing something what might happen at the construction stage or if you are constructing something what what what, what the thinking was at the design uh, stage as well so um so again uh yeah that that having that awareness not necessarily you know a complete expertise but at least the awareness of, of what the other uh, parties in the construction process have been uh, involved in and, and the theory underpinning uh, their involvement that's uh, you know very useful to be able to show that thank you both um so just looking at the time um perhaps we can do one final question if that's okay um so somebody's asked um, can you just give some more information about what you said about proceeding to professional review and how this relates to the individual route? So perhaps some clarification that this is a completely different stage to professional review? Yeah, I mean, effectively, so um, to, to if, if we go back to the um, UK spec uh, requirements set by the Engineering Council um, to uh, to go for one of the professional qualifications to be awarded by one of the licensed institutions, so whether that's EngTech, iEng, or, or CEng, um, those uh, regulations require you to either have uh, an accredited degree or have demonstrated that learning through other means. So basically, uh, as a prerequisite. So basically, the um, uh, the route that we've been talking about today is establishing that educational base so basically once you've completed this part of the of the route uh, you are in effect in the same position as someone that has um, achieved an accredited degree now it might be in all likelihood at that point you've actually you know had several years um, experience so there's no reason why uh, you know once you've uh, finished the individual route and got that uh, educational base equivalent uh, ratified that you might move immediately uh, onto the professional review process <laughs> not not necessarily on the same day I should say but uh, you know moving on uh, you know uh, um, quite rapid afterwards and that that is in fact what many candidates will will then do that professional review process um, though is is different and there will be other presentations that will cover what you need for a successful professional review that uh, that we host uh, here at CIHT and the details of that are within uh, UK spec so um, there is a difference. What we're looking at is really that knowledge and understanding. But once you move on to the professional review process, we're talking about uh, you know that that whole well-rounded engineer looking at uh, application, understanding of, of of many other aspects of engineering as well, and actually applying those um, in print in, in practice as well. Um, so, I don't. Is there anything you wanted to add to that from your perspective, David? Uh, 
I, I don't think so. You've you've covered it. Yeah, we're looking for different things, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a, it's so sometimes a, a one parallel I sometimes use is a little bit like the theory and the drive the theory and the practical test for driving. I mean, what what you're kind of demonstrating to us is you understand the theory of driving, and 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 the the professional review is all about being that engineer uh, and, and and actually applying those principles. Now, in in our case, when we're going through this individual route. Um, you, you're kind of demonstrating your understanding potentially through a little bit of your experience in doing that. So it's not quite a perfect analogy, but that's that, that hopefully puts into perspective in, in terms of what we're looking for and what will be looked at at the next stage. Thank you very much both. Um, so yeah, unfortunately we have come to the end of today's session. Um, thanks everyone for all of your questions, really good questions there and sorry that we weren't able to get through all of them. Um, but what we will be able to do is Kat and I will download a copy of all the questions that have come in today and any which um, were not responded to we'll, we'll follow up on those. Um, if you are looking for a more kind of immediate response then please feel free to also contact us um, at the education at crht.org.uk um, but apart from that I hope you found today's session helpful and yeah our thanks go to Richard and David for delivering an excellent presentation and thank you for your time today Richard and David. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And these slides will be available on the members area, uh, the members resources area um, within the next week or so, as well as a copy of today's presentation slides as well. Thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of your week.